Um, but but uh, I want <laughs> you'll, you'll get your chance. No, but anyway, um, <laughs> the uh, why do you talk about this the, this vice to virtue thing? I mean, yeah. in some sense, the the difference between the string theory of the '60s and the '80s and since the time is a huge leap. That string theory in its modern form of trying to track this, attack this fundamental problem of quantum mechanics and gravity. And, and let me make it clear, it's the, it's the, I'll say it in public, it's the, it's the best bet at this point, okay? I'll come back to other things about it. But, uh, but uh, technical crew, can you just cut out that snippet <laughs> and send it, send it to me? Just yeah. that little piece right, yeah. right there. Um, no, I, we're in a complete agreement. But it's completely different in the sense that it's really right now guided by mathematics for the most part. Yeah. And so I wonder whether you want to comment on this sort of role of aesthetics and mathematics versus experiment. Because it's a, it's a very, it's a, it's a new leap in a sense. So. It, it is a new leap in some ways. But I, I think you, you would agree that if we look back at the history of physics, say in the, in the 20th century, there are many moments where mathematics was playing a pivotal role in guiding the next step. Now, what was certainly the case, for instance, in quantum mechanics, it was much more an interplay between data and mathematics because we were describing a realm that we could probe yeah, experimentally. So, yeah. so we had the shining light of experimental data to help guide the math. This wonderful back and forth between the theory and the experiment. You know, Einstein, though, was largely guided by just this powerful intuition and mathematics. I mean, the idea that gravity is associated with curved space-time, I don't know about you, but I've never gotten over the awe that I initially felt that he came up with this idea. Yeah, it's just, just how just in remarkable. the world did he come up with this? And it was just this powerful intuition that was working within the confines of mathematics. Although, yeah, although I don't, I mean, he did have pictorial experiments. He did have those Gedanken experiments, the idea that light, you know, think of an elevator accelerating. He tended to think pictorially. And, and ultimately, he, he forced himself to learn the mathematics he needed and was almost beaten by a mathematician in his own game. That's right. But I think it's pretty clear that it was not just this unbridled pictorial sense, this unbridled creativity. It was working within the, the context of, yeah. a, of a mathematical framework sure. that really allowed him to go forward. And I think the difference today is we're in realms that are beyond current abilities to probe experimentally, or, or, or maybe not. We'll see at the yeah. Large Hadron yeah. Collider, there's a possibility. So we have to be guided yet further by mathematics. And could mathematics completely lead us astray? Yes, it's certainly possible. I don't think so, but it's possible. Why don't you think so? Well, it's just the experience that we've had. And it's also this deep-seated sense that mathematics is this language, it's almost tailor-made to describing the universe. I mean, we have, as you say, I don't know if they're in the audience right now, but they'll be in the program later on. You know, there are, are, are folks in our community who've been rightly lauded because they came up with theoretical ideas, took them seriously, that yielded predictions for particles that had never before been seen, and then people looked for those particles and found them. I mean, it's kind of breathtaking that you do this calculation and the symbols on a piece of paper that you got to by following some well-defined rules, a language, if you will, yields a new insight. It's, and, in it's, fact, and it's confirmed. In fact, you know, maybe that's something we should spend a minute on because it actually in some ways relates to, uh, to the talks we heard earlier and, and, and came up at our meeting. It's more than breathtaking. It's actually humbling and intimidating. The notion, I know Steve Weinberg, who was here earlier, has said that that the idea that when you're sitting in your room working on a piece of paper, that nature actually obeys the laws, that nature, you know, listens, not listens, but obeys what you're writing down, it, it, it is almost incomprehensible when you're actually working on it. It's, it's thrilling but intimidating at the same time. And I think one often sees, um, it, it's surprising to me that, that physicists are more, uh, seem to be more willing to sort of throw caution to the wind in that regard. We talked about the fact that for example, uh, one of the reasons evolution isn't more lauded than it might, it should be. It's, evolution is one of the most remarkable, remarkable scientific ideas in, 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 uh, that's ever come up, come up. And, and, and certainly Darwin, we, Einstein's gotten great press, but, but Darwin uh, did more, actually, in my opinion. Uh, but one of the things is that he didn't actually make predictions. It's interesting. He didn't say, hey, there's gaps in the Fox record. We should, we should look there, and it's a test of my idea. When you find it, you could vindicate it. But in physics, we tend to say, hey, this theory will fall apart if you don't find X or Y. Yes. But at the same time, um, 
Well, let's ask, what would fall apart? I mean, this is the problem with string theory in some sense. Right now, we don't have something that would fall apart if you didn't find X or Y. That, that's right. And framing it that way and using evolution as a backdrop, I think, is quite reasonable because, in a way, we're not using the right language, right? I mean, for evolution, as people were describing earlier, you know, this notion of it just being a theory is sometimes used as a strange and really unjustifiable weapon against the theory because when we, as scientists, use the word theory, we mean something very specific. Yeah. You know, the best available explanation for the data that we have at hand, and we're most happy with a theory when it makes predictions that are, are confirm or confirmable. And string theory does not meet those criteria. So in more precise language, you know, string theory should be string hypothesis. You know, David Gross uh, discussed the, the string framework. I use the language string hypothesis. No, I, I agree. Know? I think it's, I've always said it's unfair to evolution to, for string theory to be called theory. And, and then I'd have to agree with you, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I'd have to agree with you. Could, could, we, could we get that? Uh, on <laughs> um, you know, but there's, you know, it's just historical precedent that this is the language that yeah. we've fallen into. But back to your question in particular, we understand a lot about, let me just use the language, string theory. And we have, in my opinion, achieved things in that structure that I, when, for instance, I was a graduate student starting to work on this, I never thought that we'd get this far in the length of time that we have been working on it. But we've not yet gotten to the point where we can start with the equations and come up with some definitive prediction such that if it is not confirmed, we give the theory up. I mean, vaguely, we can come up with things like that, but they're so universal that it wouldn't really rule out string theory. It almost ruled all physics yeah. if, if it weren't found. And that's not a happy place to be. And, you know, it's funny how, you know, not with you, but I have encountered some people who almost interpret that as a situation that string theorists are happy with because it's some kind of, I don't know, job security yeah, yeah. Or, or, <laughs> or something like that. You know, people don't understand the tenure system <laughs> or, 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 or something like that. But the bottom line is, I certainly feel, and I'm sure all my colleagues agree, that if string theory is wrong, I really want to know right now. Right I'd now. like to know to 10 something. years ago. Because I'm not in this game to prove one particular theory right or wrong. I'm in the game because I hope that I'm part of a generation that takes us one step further, regardless of what that step happens to be. So we're working very hard to try to come up with things that we might test and there are some circumstantial things that we could talk about that might yeah. happen at the Large Hadron yeah, we'll, Collider. We'll get there probably, but but um, you know, we cannot do what you ask, namely say, this falls apart unless you find that. Now, in fact, actually, you know, he hit an important point. People tend to think scientists are wedded to theories. And um, in fact, scientists most often want to be wrong. More, more importantly, they want their colleagues to be wrong. And, <laughs> and because, because it gives you a chance, a chance to discover something new. Yeah. And so, so uh, in a sense, we want to be surprised by nature. And in fact, it's fair to say that, uh, you know, there's an interplay between theory and experiment. And we've tried to talk about that a little bit. And sometimes one leads the other. And if string theory has any validity, it'd certainly be an example of that. Usually, it's the other way around. Usually, experiment surprises us and, and, and derives us. And, and, and so the, the other thing I wanted, to, wanted you to elaborate on is that so str there, there's a problem that right now we haven't yet made, made contact with reality. But there also is the mathematics of string theory have gotten, you could either say, more complex or more fascinating. And, and in fact, it, the theory has become much uh, different. In fact, strings may not be the most, it, it may be a, not only may theory may not be the right word, strings may That's not right. be the right word. Maybe That's you want right. to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so one of the big breakthroughs in the theoretical development of string theory happened in the mid-1990s where techniques were developed to go beyond the approximate methods that had almost universally been used in calculations up to that point. And when people employed these more exact techniques, they were able to reveal aspects of the theory that were completely hidden previously. And one of the things that was revealed is that the description I gave in terms of the fundamental ingredients being these filaments, these string-like entities, is incomplete. The theory seems to also have within it objects that are two-dimensional, looking more like membranes, or three-dimensional, we call them three brains, generalization of membrane, four-dimensional entities, and so forth. So there's kind of a, a democracy, if you will, of higher-dimensional shapes that play a role in the theory. Strings were dis 